uh, at Gagosian Gallery in, in London, one of the best galleries <laughs> that are in the contemporary art scene right now. You have, uh, there are so there many. so many. There's so many <laughs> happening. Oh I my think God, oh, there's okay. Pamela Sundstrom and um, Fatima mm -hmm. in Goodman, or in Goodman Gallery, Goodman yes, Gallery. on Cork Street. Yes. This is such an exciting month and week for African art in London. Absolutely. And also I have to say like 10 years ago, there were no galleries that were specializing with African artists or had African artists on their book. And now you can probably have list like 12 or 15 shows so that are happening just this month in London. Well, um, I kind of like the first question as well about the US because there are also lots and lots of places you can see it in the US as well. Um, but definitely 154, if anyone is in town, please come to our show, but definitely check out 154 at Somerset House because you will find what, 20 different galleries in one place. So that's definitely worth a visit. Oh, and uh, can, so, sorry, can I mention something um, that Camille has been working on? She has made a list of um, uh, prominent and important uh, artists, female artists that will be in exhibition at the 154. If anyone is interested in getting that list with also um, the information on the, the, the artist and their work that will be exhibited, you can also contact her for that. Yes, and what we plan to do um, as an Eastern Area Arts facet, uh, Art Six Feet Apart, is to collect all the information, all the recommendations for galleries, museums, artists, and comprise a directory, um, not only for London, but if this is the first stop. So the other states, you know who you are, I've been in touch with you. We have a whole series of e-museum tours uh, to come. And we will certainly um, have a nice directory of current exhibitions and future for everyone. So at this time, we're gonna take a few questions from the floor. Uh, Link Conchita, can you bring those attendees in who have their hands up? There are four questions. We're gonna get through those four and then we're gonna move on to, uh, to the next segment. But let's hear from our guest. Link Valerie. While Link Conchita is bringing in those with the questions, I would like to acknowledge that our national president, Link Kim Jeffries Leonard, has joined us for this art adventure. So welcome, Link Kim. Welcome. Excellent. Okay. Well, we are certainly. Like, yeah, it looks like some of the questions that, that some of the hands that were raised, some of them have gone down now. So maybe their questions were answered during the presentations. So if there are any other questions, feel free and you would like to be, come in, um, feel free to raise your hand and we will allow you to speak. Okay, from this side, I can see two hands up. Um, I don't know if you see the same thing. Yes, we had a couple of hands up and um, we've sent some signals to those hands and so um, they, are un they can unmute themselves to talk. Okay, well perhaps they've um, stepped away to refresh in their, their rum punches or <laughs> Get their cod fritters and jerk chicken, jerk chicken wings ready for uh, for Link Ashley to come in. But if you, if they do return, if anybody um, has any questions, in addition to the attendees that had hands up, feel free to place them in the chat. Um, we would love to get them, and we'll make sure we get back to you later on. Uh, so at this point, um, Link Siobhan, do you have any? Closing remark, remarks, Link Siobhan, Link Hannah, uh, Link Hannah. Hannah, you've become a Link sister all of a sudden, right? Uh, <laughs> Hannah or Kami, do you have any closing remarks before we um, move on to the next segment? This has been fabulous and we really do appreciate your time and thank you all, we're excited. Well, um, Valerie, if we have time, you know, there is so many other artworks to, re to view, actually. <laughs> you know, um, you just saw like a small section and we kind of raced through it so that we could give you the maximum coverage, you know, and not speaking to everything that, that is here. So we have the experts here so we can absolutely continue this and, you know, 
you know, talk about other, you know, Hannah's favorite uh, pieces, actually. <laughs> well, you won't shut me up if you do that. No, 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 really. <laughs> so, so we have another five, ten minutes. Should we do that? So, so as, you know, not to waste time. You're here for the art. So yeah, to, you know, you know to really... that, that, that's a great idea, but there, the questions have resurfaced. Um, if we can <laughs> Um, oh, I'm going to step out of the frame because <laughs> no, you look great there. I, I think you you should stay in the frame there. Um, it's a great work of art. The three of you in front of that L and and a suite. It's a fabulous, sure. fabulous, <laughs> fabulous <laughs> work. Uh, so there are 52 countries in Africa, and the question is: Does Sotheby's do outreach throughout the continent of Africa? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, there are 54 countries in Africa. It is vast. It is a huge continent. I can't cover it all by myself. Um, I'm a t we're, we run a very, very small department with big ambitions and big hopes to expand. Um, we go to the places that have the largest art markets. So maybe that's kind of a connected question. The, the strongest art markets on the continent are in South Africa, Nigeria, and Morocco. So those are the three countries we go to the most often to speak with collectors and consigners and, and buyers in those places and to promote our sales. And we often host events, um, cocktail parties and lectures, and um, we're very involved in those places. Um, I also go to Ghana. Uh, uh, where else? <laughs> I travel as much as I can. Um, I also travel to the States and throughout Europe. African art has a hugely wide appeal. Typically in our sales, we have bidders coming in from every continent, from in every sale, it's something like 58, 59 countries are registered to bid, which is really exciting for us. And about a third of those are in Africa, but two thirds of our buyers are African. So Africa as a continent and as a, a geography is so important for us. And obviously it's a place that Sotheby's hadn't been active in before. At present, we don't have offices there apart from in Cairo um, in Egypt, but we get on ground as often as possible. Um, and it's definitely, if, you know, I'm sure there are many, many people, African people or people who travel to Africa in your audience, but you can appreciate African art wherever you live and you can see it in London now, thankfully, and you can see it all over the United States. But for me, the only real way to learn and to appreciate it is to, to get on the ground and to meet the collectors and meet the artists. So I do that as much as I can. Okay. Can I just say something? Um, we know that the upcoming London sale for contemporary African art is next Thursday, October 9th. Question is, when is the Contemporary African Sale in, at Sotheby's New York? When is the next one happening? Oh, uh, TBD. <laughs> um, we, at present, we only have sales in London in this category. Uh, we have two sales a year here. Um, historically, the market has been growing in London and that has, for various reasons, um, really it's kind of a crossroads for a lot of Europe and African collectors. Um, sales in New York are definitely something I would love to expand into um, when the time is right, when the market is big enough. Um, I get to New York as often as I can. We obviously have our headquarters there. Uh, we do sell some African artists in our international sales and we sometimes preview our African sales in New York. Uh, sadly, our preview, we were supposed to have an exhibition there um, last month in September, uh, which was sadly canceled due to COVID. So hopefully we'll be back next year with some highlights exhibitions um, before we have sales there. And I will definitely make sure that this group is notified because we would love, love, love to have you into the galleries. Excellent, excellent. Okay, um, I'm looking at the chat. There is one last question and I wanna thank Siki Dorley for the question about the continent of Africa. We now have a question from Christine Saunders. Are there any Windrush art pieces being exhibited? First of all, what is Windrush? Does anybody right. know? <laughs> that is a dramatic context. I was going to say, maybe that's a question for you. What is Windrush? That well, is a big question. That's a big question for, for um, that's, that will be answered and discussed in the next session, the second um, session coming up. Um, but my ancestors were part of the Windrush generation. Um, that's when a lot of um, people from the Caribbean immigrated to um, the UK with, I would say, the, the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So I would say half my family 
came over at that time, they were given because they were part of the, um, Commonwealth. the Commonwealth and they had a, um, set up this law which enabled people from the Commonwealth countries to come to London, to the UK, but not expecting for black people to actually do that. This was really set up for the English people to come over freely without having a passport. But then, you know, once we got wind of that, you know, oh, we can actually go there, you know, and get the possibility of a better life, everyone started to come. Of course, they weren't met with any type of welcoming open arms. And, uh, you know, so that is kind of a big scandal because of a lot of people that came over. Um, they, they really never got their papers um, legalized. And it became an issue a couple of years ago when suddenly people were being kicked out after, you know, second generation and things like that. But I don't want to go on and... and <laughs> and we'll discuss it because we'll be discussed later. Actually. I'm going to answer the first question, that, which is whether we have any Windrush artists yes. in the sale. Um, in short, not really. As Siobhan says, it's a um, more of a Caribbean British issue. Or Windrush HMS Windrush itself was was a, a, a ship that came sailed from the Caribbean to the UK. Having said that, there is a generation of artists. African diaspora artists, uh, Caribbean artists, African artists who found themselves in the UK and found it very difficult to break into the art world. So this, yeah. there has been a black British arts movement since the 1970s with artists saying we can't get representation, no one wants to see our work, no curators are not including us in their shows. And so there were some amazing artists who founded um, kind of their own group, uh, people like Eddie Chambers and Lubena Himid and an amazing generation of artists who I adore. Um, I don't include them in this sale because to me they are British artists exactly. and should be, we should be looking at them in, a, in our British context and talking about them in British art history. Well done. Um, and we do, and we do include them in our British sales and we do include them in our international contemporary art sales. Um, this sale, we do focus on the African continent, so artists who, who live and work in Africa. Wonderful. But that Wonderful. is a really good question. It's something I'm quite passionate about. Awesome. Thank you both for that. We are um, have about 30 seconds left for this segment. So I'm going to ask you to please extend any final remarks. Link Ashley is preparing to come in. It's approaching the brunch in New York, uh, in the US, brunch time, lunch time. And I guess it's high tea time in, in London or, or happy hour, perhaps, or, or for some. So it was Ashley, I can, I can smell the food uh, through, through, the, through the Zoom screen. <laughs> Paris to come in with her recipes. Um, Sotheby's London, on behalf of the uh, Lynx Incorporated, the Eastern area uh, in particular, and uh, the Mighty Arts facet, we want to just say thank you from the, from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, if you look at the chats, it's overwhelming. Um, everybody has had a phenomenal time. They have thoroughly enjoyed all the works that you featured. Several plan to not only watch the auction. Um, what day is that again, Hannah? It's October 9th, is that correct? Right, so the auction is a timed online auction, but the closing is on Friday, Friday the 9th of October. It closes at 3 p.m. London time, so that is 10 a.m. East Coast time. So get your bids in. Yeah, get your bids in. <laughs> um, again, on behalf of the entire uh, Links Incorporated, we just want to say thank you, ladies. Thank you, thank you. And if you have a 30-second soundbite that you'd like to close out with, feel free to do so now. Well, I just want to um, thank Anna and Camille for really their support and their participation and you know just being really patient with us and going through this several times to, from the rehearsal to you know to really privatizing almost the gallery for us and especially at this time you have to realize they just got everything up literally yesterday <laughs> so and they were really rushing that so we could do our uh, rehearsal. So really the privilege and the exclusivity of the whole thing has been really exceptional. So I just want to thank them. And to thank you all you know, for being here with us. We really feel the love across the continent and we are really, really 
excited and overwhelmed with the response and you know bon appetit uh, live from London. Thank you again to Siobhan for trusting me with this journey and to, to Hannah as well who made it possible for us to, to be here virtually all together. Uh, bon appétit and I hope you had a lovely, lovely time. It was a pleasure to do this tour with you today. I'm going to jump in and just say it was all of our pleasures at Sotheby's. We are so grateful and honoured to have you here in the galleries. I'm so pleased that you came to us with this idea. I hope we can do it again and again and again. I really, really enjoyed it. It's always a pleasure working with you for me. It's always a pleasure working with you, Siobhan. And thank you to Valerie and everyone at the Lynx um, for including us in your event today. I am so jealous that you're going off to have your high tea or brunch. I wish I was doing that. I'm going back to the office. Um, but you do know where to find me. Please contact me with any questions, any help I can give you about the auction or about Pack of Not in general. I'm so happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. So at this time, we're going to wave goodbye, give them a Queen's wave to uh, Link Siobhan and our uh, Sotheby's experts in London. And we're going to ask uh, Link Ashley to come on in and tell us what you're serving up for lunch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before I kind of show you what I'm serving, um, I just want to kind of talk about the importance of food um, through the slave trade into the Americas and ultimately back to England um, as a chef and a food enthusiast, but also as, you know, uh, somebody who really enjoys history. I feel that food is the true gatekeeper of, of history. You can see the influences. You can literally trace the food that you eat in America, in the Americas, um, from the shores of West Africa to Portugal and Spain to England and throughout Southern US, the Caribbean and South America. Um, the slaves and the ship owners brought things to the Americas like um, bene or sesame seeds, watermelon, kidney beans, rice, okra. You know, all of these things are stapled in our diet um, up and down the coast. Um, so what I cook today um, is mostly Jamaican food. So we did cod fritters, if you guys can see that, um, and beef patties. I did sweet potato waffles because it's brunch. And I also made Jamaican jerk chicken. And of course, just a rum punch for fun. Um, so what's interesting about all these things, um, you can really, really see kind of the history in it. So for instance, the beef patties. Um, all of us have sort of a version of a pastry filled, a savory pastry filling. Um, this one particular, it said that part of the or origins are from the Cornish pastry in England. Um, the spices that are in them like cardamom and cumin came from India. Um, and then, of course, the spice came from Africa. Um, the cod fritters. Salted cod was originally um, attributed to Portuguese and English um, sailors um, in order to be able to eat it while they're um, exploring, which obviously made it through the, the slave trade and made it into cod fritters. Um, the jerk chicken, um, originated the, the idea of jerk actually originated with the Tano people in Jamaica, um, but the spices um, and, and the attribution to chicken came from the African laborers. Um, one thing about the, the pastries is, you know, some of these ingredients, again, because of history, you can trace back to 4,000 years ago to India. So it's just really interesting that every time you eat something delicious, you're eating a bit of history. Um, so I hope you all, if you didn't make it today, you try sometime this uh, month. If you uh, have any questions, you also have my email. So please feel free to email me uh, about any recipe issues. Um, and also, if you are looking for some delicious sauces that would go well with them, I make a really great hot sauce. You also have a link for that um, that you can order. And I guess if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer those.
So I, I think we're trying to play a video that we can't hear. So the volume, Siobhan seems to be in a black, is she in a black taxi right now? She seems to be in a black cab uh, trying to address us, but we can't hear her. So while we're um, trying to get the volume all set, there is a question or two for, uh, for Ashley. And Ashley, can you still hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, one question is, um, I'm curious about the role of sugar in the transatlantic. Uh, and, and, and I guess that's just, a, it doesn't, there's no more after that. So do you want to just maybe touch upon um, the role just a tad to um, satisfy that person's curiosity? Sure. So I guess sugar is something I haven't touched on so much more other spices. Um, but of course, um, one of the main things, uh, main ways that sugar had been transported over to um, Europe and then to Africa was via rum. Um, so the production of rum, um, which obviously used a lot of sugar, um, was something that really kind of went around the world through the slave trade. Okay, awesome, thank you for that. Um, there's another question, and it says, let's see, I'm looking at the chat here. I missed the link for the recipes. Can it be sent out one more time? Um, so what we're going to, going to do is um, the Eastern Area has a website, and the Arts Facet has a link uh, on that website with our section. So we'll post the recipes as well as information about uh, the art tour uh, in that, on that website and we'll let you know when it's all there, but absolutely. And, and it was actually in the last uh, registration if you got that um, as well, there was a link there, but we'll sh make sure that you are all, um, and I'll try to put the link in the chat before we end today, if I can also pull that off. Um, I can also say, just in case you miss all of that for some reason, um, you can email me personally at ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y, dot one dish, spelled out, O-N-E-D as in dog, I-S-H, at gmail.com. And I'll happily forward those recipes to you or answer any other questions you have about kind of food history or just food in general. Perfect. And I will definitely get that link in the chat um, before the session ends, part two. So at this time, um, let me just see the, the most of the questions uh, Link Ashley about are about where can we find the recipes. Um, <laughs> Ashley also had, a, a, I'm going to share this, she's very modest. She also had a fabulous um, restaurant in London called Stagalese. Um, and when we were all visiting for the chartering of the London chapter, several of us had a chance to visit. We then followed her to Martha's Vineyard, where she held fabulous cooking events uh, during the summer last year. And she introduced us to a line of her delicious sauces, hot sauces, spicy sauces, sweet sauces. And the link to purchase those sauces uh, will also be available in the guide that we share with the recipe. So thank you again, um, Ashley, for coming in and sharing some of your wonderful <laughs> recipes with us. Uh, we're going to move on to the second part of our program uh, here today. Again, many of you are wondering why is Black History Month celebrated in October in the UK? Uh, and, and in addition, what exactly are the customs, um, the traditions, and how do they partake in uh, recognizing the rich Black British history? Uh, and so uh, we're going to ask, uh, Siobhan, I think, is on her way over to Hopes. She's jumped in a black cab. She was trying to say something to us. Conchita, um, are you able to bring Siobhan back in to just set this next set up? Why don't we try to see if we can hear her, and if not, we'll, we'll wave at her, and then we'll just transition. So why don't we give that one more try? We've been trying to get her in. Let's, let's try it again. We had some trouble with her sound. Let's see if we can get in. Okay. 
we wanted to make this as live as possible. So bear with us as we transition to the taxi to see if we can, can hear from our lovely Siobhan. Looks like we're still having troubles trying to connect to her in the taxi. And you're, we can't, we can't hear you, Valerie. I think you may be muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, I was just acknowledging that we know Siobhan is in the cab on her way uh, to the next segment, but we're going to keep the program on schedule and ask uh, Link Hope, who uh, heads fund development for the London chapter, to come in and extend greetings and tell us about what part two is all about. I see your panelists are all queued in and we welcome everyone. So Hope, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Valerie. Yes, everyone is here. Saturday greetings to our Madam Area Director, Shawana Tucker-Sims. And I understand we now have with us our national president, Kimberly Jeffries Leonard. It's so lovely to have you with us and to all in attendance and of course, to my London chapter members, welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us at Sotheby's, the art six feet apart. I do hope you enjoyed the collection. Now for segment two, we are celebrating Black History Month in the UK. My name is Hope Jakimi, and as Valerie mentioned, I am the fund development chair for the London chapter and founder of HJM Group. Joining us in conversation are some incredible women and passionate women, and I'm so thrilled to have them with us today. Before I introduce to you the panelists, I would like to uh, bring in Ajua Debenka, who is the strategy program manager of UCLH and a proud Ghanaian sister who adores her head wraps. Ajua, are you here? Ajua will give us a brief learning on the significance of Gelis, aka head wraps. Aj, are you here? I am here. Hello, everyone. Thank you. So, Aj, can you just give us a little um, understanding on what the Gelis? are all about in this. Okay, so the brief was um, significance of Gili, um, aka head wraps, um, from a Ghanaian perspective and differences across the diaspora. Um, this is so broad um, for the time. So actually, I think I would like to um, proceed with using the term head wrap, um, but for us to all understand that that is actually the incorrect term. Um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is culture and custom, symbols and celebration. So the ethnic people um, of Calabar in the area known as Nigeria call their head wraps Bokit. The Asante people of whom I originate from uh, call head wraps Duku, Duku and the Yoruba people call their head wraps Geli. So I think before we can actually talk about head wraps, it's important to have some context. And that is to understand that before the imposed borders on the African continent by Europeans in 1884, um, so that they could administer, um, but let's read loot, um, regions of Africa, there were empires and kingdoms, so uh, such as Aksum, the kingdom of Ghana, um, which is not related to modern day Ghana, but would have been located in the area which is now around Mauritania and a bit of Mali, um, the kingdom of Congo, the kingdom of Mali, and the Nok and the Ife, just to mention a minuscule amount. And these cultures had specific symbols, traditions, and customs in terms of recognizing um, important events. And to varying degrees, these um, cultures had wealth. And so maybe naturally, 
an extension of that culture would be the way in which the woman presents herself. And so some of these things could be um, coming of age, um, the loss of a husband, or um, to show one's um, position um, in society. So for example, in the ethic culture, um, the length of cloth was dependent on which order you were born as a daughter. So if you were the eldest daughter, your head wrap would have cloth which was longer than the second daughter um, compared to the third daughter. And then in terms of in, if we go to Ghana, modern day Ghana on the west coast of Africa, um, the wearing of a head tie known as a duku in, in a funeral setting is something that would have to be worn and it would have to be a particular color. And all women would have to wear it, apart from if you have the status of being a queen mother, then you do not wear a headscarf, but your hair is cut in a particular way. And everything that you would be wearing and the jewelry that you would be wearing would show people that you had the status of a queen mother. And also the way you would even enter that ceremony, there would be a procession that would show that you are a queen mother. So this is just to really say that the, the, the way in which it's worn has different meanings and, and, and symbolisms depending on the, the tribe of people that you come from. So now really what I want to talk about is um, symbols. So I've got some cloth here and um, I am wearing one of my favorites. Um, and actually in Ashanti culture, old traditional cloth um, versus maybe newer cloth have names and those names have a meaning. So for example, this cloth that I'm wearing is called Abain Kaba. And that means handcuffs. And the full name of the cloth is Efie Ya Anka Abain Kaba En Shemesa. And basically what it means is, the literal translation is, all is not well. If everything was well, I would not be wearing handcuffs. Mm -hmm. And it actually has a political um, connotation as well. And it actually reflects a loss of faith in government and also injustice. So you would most probably not wear this cloth to uh, a christening, unless you're trying to give somebody some side eye. <laughs> so I also have another piece of cloth, which I really love. And you've most probably seen this, this pattern. And this pattern is called Efie Busia. Efie Busia. And again, the full name is Se Efie Busia Taiwa E Ya Sin Abontin Die. And what that means is, it's like the enemy within. If somebody in your home does something to hurt you, it's more hurtful than that stranger on the street, that person that is not of our home. So this is to say that if we look at just within the, just a Santi culture, you know, the cloth has meanings. And again, this is most probably a way that you could send a message to somebody without saying anything because actually the Ashanti culture is quite conservative. And actually in, in specific settings, you most probably would not even talk at a particular level, you would speak very low. And that is for men and women, because to speak in a low, in a higher octave is disrespectful. But maybe if you're trying to get the point across to somebody, you may be wearing a cloth to send a message to someone. Um, I know that I don't have much time, so I want to, so we've covered the culture, we've talked a little bit about symbolism, so I want to end on celebration. And that is to say that 
as African women, wherever we find ourselves, we do not need ceremony in order to wear cloth. You do not need as though you need to be given permission to wear cloth. The permission you carry in your DNA, it's in your blood. And if it's something that you want to do, embrace it, make it easy and accessible for yourself. And so maybe you would um, look to have cloth in particular colors that you know that you like that match your wardrobe so that it's easy because actually if you don't have it to hand it might not come to mind that it's something that you want to do but now that you know that within some cultures and most probably within all of the different kingdoms uh, cultures that i've talked about cloth has meaning you may want to make sure that you are wearing a cloth that is befitting of the 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 situation that's if you're going somewhere but otherwise on a daily basis i think if it's something that you want to do do it and that's Amazing. the end thank you so much that was wonderful that was that a great was absolutely wonderful um hope there are a couple of questions adwa if you're um Free to stay on for another moment to take a question. Absolutely. So thank you for letting us know that the head wrap uh, is really not the appropriate term. The question is, what is the appropriate term and how do you spell it? So if I go back to, I, I think what I'm saying is we, we can amongst ourselves, because let me just say I'm talking uh, with my sisters and family, we can use the term head wrap because there are so many different names for it depending on the country, depending on the culture. So I think it's to say that when you use the term head wrap, just know that to that person in Mali, it's a different name. To that person in Egypt, the African Egyptian is a different name. To that person in South Africa, it's a different name. But we can use head wrap as an umbrella term. Okay. Or the word, was it gi? G? So gele for the people of the Yoruba people. And how is that spelled? So that, my understanding is that it is G-E-L-E-E. -E. Right. Okay. Awesome. All right, so that should answer that question. There's just another, let's see. So we answered the spelling of the head wrap. Um, lots of kudos to you and thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. People are very enlightening, enlightened. They're saying they're never gonna look at a head wrap the same way again. It, this was very informative. This was an excellent presentation. The fabric that you just presented, is this, one, do you have a company uh, that sells this fabric and can it be ordered online? Okay, I don't have a company that sells this fabric, but it's easily, it's accessible. And what I want to say is, I understand that we live in a world of commercialism, but one of the things we have to understand is, when these patterns were made by our forefathers and foremothers, they did it for the community. They did it for us. We didn't have copyright. You know, that the African custom and culture is not an individualistic culture. It's about collectivism and community. So for example, any market in, in Accra is going to sell this. And it comes in lots of different colors as well. So actually you will see exactly the same cloth, but it might be in a red and orange, or it might be just a different color combination. But the symbol of the circles intertwined, those who know, and now that includes you, means that you know that this cloth is called a buying cover and you know what it means. Just like the it comes in, I've seen it in like a green and orange color. So they come in lots of different colors. It's the same print. The meaning is the same, but the presentation in terms of color. But no, I do not own um, a, a company that sells it. But you know, any, if you're on the continent or if not, maybe in a market um, and you see some cloth, 
What I will say though is a lot of, and, and these cloths are very, very old. So we're talking about these patterns are, well, not very old, but sort of over a hundred years old. You know, I've got pictures of my grandmother and my great grandmother wearing some of these patterns. And I've, I've always been called an old soul because growing up, these were always the kind of patterns that I liked. Um, there are newer patterns and some of these patterns are not made by us. They are um, sort of made by um, non-African people that are trying to capture this part of the market. And so that they make these cloths and they give them names as well. They try to name them. But in naming them, those names have nothing to do with us or not related to us. I remember being in the market and looking at something and my sister said, um, oh, my cousin, but my sister said, oh, I know that is from China. And she said, and, and the name, and when you translate it, it has nothing to do with us or any meaning to do with us. So, I mean, I would say if you take a trip to Ghana and you can have somebody take you to markets who knows about cloth, it's well worth it. And I thank you so much for that. I would also add for those that are in the New York area, there's a wonderful African market on 116th Street um, and Lenox Avenue. Uh, there are vendors in there from many different continent, di different countries uh, on the continent or from the continent of Africa. And they have lovely fabrics. In fact, I am wearing one today. So at this time, thank you again, Adwa. We can't thank you enough for that education on um, our jellies or head wraps. And at this time, I uh, hope your panelists, I'm sure, are anxious to give us an overview of Black History Month in London, what it all means. So why don't you all come in and uh, let's get this conversation started. Great. Thanks again, Ash. I appreciate it. Uh, so on to our panelists. Let me do the honors of introducing them to you. Asha Johnson. Asha Johnson joined the Learning and Outreach Department of the Black Culture Archives in January 2019. She divided her time between her role at BCA and the completion of her PhD, which was a collaborative award between Newcastle University and the National Archives. Her research can concerned the development of poor relief in social services in the Caribbean from 1838 to 1938, focusing on gendered perspectives of the experience of poverty, as well as on the work of women as activists and movements of self-determination. Upon completion of her thesis in December 2019, Asha's role at BCA evolved to include responsibility for programming, and wider public engagement. She draws on her experience as a museum and community educator to reach out to adults and young people who are not assessing formal education and also facilitates research collaborations with UK universities. Asha, thank you, welcome. Marisa Childs. Marisa Childs has worked in the fashion industry for over 25 years. She sits on the board of streetwear brand Nishi Limited as director of product and sourcing. Marisa is also CEO of NC Consultant, a full product lifecycle solution service with responsible production at its core. Marisa has led teams large and small in both luxury and high street retail to include All Saints, French Connection and Burberry. Marisa became a voluntary school governor in November 2015 and was appointed chair in January 2017. She is currently the vice chair of the Federation of Seabright, Dubrovni, and Lorsen Schools. She also sits on the Hackney Education Board School Board, overseeing every education forum in the borough. Welcome, 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 ladies. Thank you for joining us. So Thank you. Shall we get into our conversation? Yes. Asha, are you there? I am. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so just a little backstory um, about the United Kingdom and Black history. Um, some of you may or may not know, but in the United Kingdom, Black History Month was first celebrated in October 
1987, so really not that long ago. Um, it was organized through the leadership of a Ghanaian analyst. And to all my Ghanaian sisters on this uh, joining us, please forgive me, don't come for me if I say this name wrong. Akaba Adai Sibo, who served as the coordinator of special projects in the Greater London Cal Council. And so he created the collaboration and got it underway. Um, Asha, I think I'll begin with you if you don't mind. Um, could you tell a little bit about how the month is celebrated and the effectiveness it brings about awareness in the UK? Um, it, it's celebrated in, in so many different ways. I'd probably start by talking about how I first came to know about it. So before I even entered this sector, when I first heard about Black History Month, I was all over London at, at all different events. There were events in libraries, museums, everywhere. And for me, it was a wonderful experience meeting like-minded people, having good discussions. It was about literature, it was about history, it was about dance, absolutely everything. Um, how it's celebrated, it, it kind of depends very much on the organization and on the individual. So, for example, there'll be schools, some schools will really be enthusiastic about it and try and make the most of it and teach the children as much as they can about the history of black people. Others, if they don't understand why they're doing it in the first place, because it's never been explained and they've never learned it or never understood the importance of it, might be less committed. So of recent years, you have people in certain organizations calling it diversity month or inclusion month. And some of the events might be quite superficial, like bring a dish from your country or everybody wear your traditional dress or teach us something from your language, kind of nothing that really gets to the root of the history that, that, that's trying to be understood. And another thing which has become increasingly recognized is the fact that it often has a US focus. So mm. when you say let's learn about black history, it will be learning about Malcolm X, it'll be learning about Harriet Tubman, it'll be learning about Martin Luther King, which is great and we should know that, but we've all been taught that from childhood. What we need now, I think, is in the UK is more focus on black British civil rights. So I think everything that's happened up to now is brilliant and we should just build on that and, and keep building on that. Yeah, I agree with that. Definitely um, more about British uh, several rights for sure. Um, so I wanted to, I think I, I'll, I'll, I'll send this question to you, Marisa. Um, could you explain why the people of the Caribbean migrated to Britain? Um, and then if you don't mind, if you could just share a little bit um, about your amazing 106 year old grandmother who is blessed to <laughs> be with us, um, her story, a little bit, just a little bit. Sure. Well, thank you, uh, Link Sisters, for having me. Um, in terms of the first question with regards to migration, my, I am a uh, first generation Black British. My family are from Jamaica. My grandmother, who's 107, uh, not 106. Um, oh, yes, know. yes. Her and my grandfather came here in the 60s. So my grandfather came first, and just like your sister Siobhan was explaining, basically there was a message sent out to the Commonwealth. And whether they went to do it on purpose or not, the message was, after, particularly after what, the, the war, World War II, come to, come to the motherland, come to England, there were jobs here for you, they needed nurses, they needed, they needed people to work on, on the underground system, they needed bus drivers, they needed all these, all these manual labor jobs, and so they sent out a message to say there's an opportunity here. Um, for my grandparents specifically, and my, my grandparents didn't come here until they were in their 40s. So my grandmother had had all of her children in Jamaica. They, they, my grandfather was an entrepreneur. They had many, they had different businesses. They were from a place called Manchester in Corleyville, which is the countryside. And my grandmother ran a, man, uh, ran a rum bar there. So they had, you know, they were, they were doing, they were doing okay. They had a very nice life there. My grandfather wanted to travel basically. And he saw this opportunity as his brother was coming back and forth from the US with all these fancy shoes and fancy clothes. And my grandfather wanted a bit of that himself. He was like, okay. His brother David came to, came to London. And so he, he flew here. My, my grandparents didn't come on the Windrush uh, boats. My grandfather came on a plane in 1960. 
and my grandfather came, my grandmother, sorry, so my grandfather came in 1960, and then my grandfather, my grandmother followed in 1962, and then the children, then my, there are four of them, so my mother and my uncle, who are the eldest, they came in 1965, and then the, the twins, my, my aunts, came in 1966. So, so yes, they, they literally came uh, looking for opportunity. Um, and in the second half, speaking about my amazing grandmother, who I did take a beef soup to her house to sit with her yesterday, because she does still live in her own home and she is the queen and we all rally round her. Um, she, um, she, not long after all of her children here in 1966, my grandfather died uh, later that year. So my grandmother was left with, because my mother came here at 12 with four children, all at school. They were all in school, all school age. And her husband had died and she, um, she worked three jobs. So she had a job that started at seven o'clock in the morning, working in a printing house in East London, were sort of like coupons that go into like the Sunday magazine, Sunday Times or something like that. So she did that, I think from sort of 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Then she did her main job, which was um, working in an old people's home. Um, looking after washing and cleaning and feeding all people who told her she was a mother, all sorts of profanity that they would tell her that she was, you know, she was inhuman. And then her last job was, um, was a cleaning job. And she did that for many years to keep a roof over her head, to feed her four children and, and to get them through school. Hard working, hard working. <laughs> perseverance right Aisha Absolutely. I want thank you Marisa Aisha do you want to kind of chime in on um the Caribbean migration to Britain a bit hmm. the yeah, well, yeah it's really interesting what Marisa just said and one of your previous speakers about the reasons people coming over I would say that there, we've got evidence in our archive of that recruitment active recruitment was happening in the Caribbean so before people ever came here so on the one hand, it may have appeared that it was like an open invitation, but on the other hand, you see they specifically targeted the West Indies because the West Indians spoke English. So there were ideas to get people from other parts of the empire. They were going to bring people from Cyprus to the UK as part of this post-war rebuilding. But they specifically, in the end, chose the Caribbean. And my mother was, wanted to study nursing. And she said, you would just see the different adverts from the different hospitals. You would apply from, from Jamaica or whichever island you were from. And then they write back to say, you've been accepted. And then you would fly over and, and start. And also we have photographs of, of London Transport recruiting men from Barbados and the adverts to sign up. And there are also lots of adverts on, on, on passages over on the boat and how, how cheap it is. So. So Britain definitely, they wanted it, well, they wanted us and they didn't want us in a sense. They wanted the labor, but then they didn't really want people, you know how it is. It's kind of a paradox there. But I do also want to point out the fact that um, although the Windrush, which arrived in, in 1948, was perhaps the most iconic ship that came, there have been people coming and going from these islands for millennia. There were people on that Windrush who'd already been in the UK. They'd been part of World War II and they were coming back. There, be, there are people who've been coming here from before the World Wars, from Edwardian times, from Victorian times, from Georgian times. So I just think it's important that we situate these Windrush migrations within a longer history. Otherwise, to the, to the uninformed, they may get the impression that suddenly immigrants started to come, and, and whereas in the past, it wasn't like that. And I think that's problematic because when you, when you have, for example, like drama series on TV set in like, you know, Jane Austen times. People expect to see white faces only because that's what they've always seen. Recently now filmmakers are starting to put in black faces and people are jumping up and down saying, that's just totally, why are you putting these, these black faces in just for the sake of trying to be inclusive? There were no black people here then. And then the historians stand up and say, actually, yes, there were, and this is perfectly authentic. So uh, yeah, I hope that answers the, the question about the wider migrations. It does. Thank you so much. So um, to still stay on um, the topic, but just to bring in the Africans who kind of migrated here, can we talk about the similarities and the differences between um, the Caribbean and the Africans? Yeah, I, I can start. Um, 
I, I, I think, I was thinking about that question earlier today and how much I know about migration here from the Caribbean, not so much from Africa, but my understanding is that from the, from the continent, it was more from an education point of view. People were coming to the UK to study, whereas from, from the Caribbean, people were coming here to look for, to look for work and, and job opportunities. Yeah, and I, can I add to what Marissa said? I think that that's certainly the impression I have overall. But there's a lady I know called Jennifer C. Jallo, who is of um, Sierra Leone origin. And she, uh, about 15 years ago, she interviewed men who came from Sierra Leone. A lot of them stowed away. And they came in the 1930s and 1940s, and they settled in Notting Hill. And Notting Hill is typically associated with, with the Caribbean. But these men had been coming from before that. And so... Um, one thing I'm keen to do with her next year is maybe to relaunch those oral histories in that book to coincide with Sierra Leone independence. And also to try, we want to try and draw out some of the other African histories. Because as an organization, we started, we were begun by West Indians, mostly Jamaicans, but we want to appeal to all African communities. Um, and also there are Somalis that we know have been here since the very beginning of the 20th century, at least. And so we're trying to make sure that their stories are told as well within our within our program right and you guys are doing a really good job with sharing stories um from the people of the caribbean and africa and just our black history um so let's i i think if we can stay on this subject just a little bit you know in terms of the two populations um would you say that there's some unity between the two populations and what does the relationships look like at present? Can we talk about that or? Yeah. Uh, did you want to go first, Marissa? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think it's certainly changed. I, I know in the 1980s, there were young, young Africans would actually not, weren't proud of their names. You hear about people that would change their names because it wasn't cool to be African back in the 80s. But I think what's happened is the more that people of Caribbean origin have started to research their African ancestry and take pride in it. And so Africans don't feel they have to be, you know, I think maybe because the Caribbean culture is not so much dominant now as it was before. So Africans are coming into their own. For the youngsters now, I don't think it's an issue. You know, my son's best friend is Ghanaian. His other best friend is Somali. They're not really bothered about it. I think it's more our parents' generation, the Windrush, so-called Windrush generation. When they came here, this was the first time they'd met people from the African continent whose manners, whose languages, whose clothes, whose food was also alien and different. And I think for the Africans who were here, they thought, who are these Jamaican troublemakers coming in? Because <laughs> they've come for different reasons, with different attitudes. But um, all that's settled down. And certainly within our, our staff, we're, re we've got, we're represented by, we've got Ghanaian staff, we've got American staff, Nigerian, Jamaican, English, so Trinidadian as well, I think. Hope I haven't missed out any of my colleagues. So mm -hmm. it's a great mixture. Marisa, did you want to share something? Yeah, I would say that my grandmother's generation, and I think... Aisha, um, she, one of the words she uses, difference and fear, and fear can create a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of ignorance. And I think there was a sense of fear for, say, my grandmother's generation when they came here and met their African brothers and sisters and didn't understand each other. So there was, a, there was sort of a standoffish of we don't understand each other. Um, right. So I do know that there, ha there are differences. And I do think um, now we understand each other more. My, I have Africans that married into my family from when I was a child. So I've been brought up in a, in a family that was, has Jamaicans and Ghanaians in it. But I am aware that, you know, my grandmother's generation, there's, you know, there was a bit of a discomfort. Now my son, and dare I say, it may, may sound insignificant, but it really isn't. And the, the Black Panther, as an example, um, my, my son's generation and watching that film and the pride that it, I mean, it's just a, it's just a movie, right? But the pride that it instilled in young black children here. I, mean, I was at the cinema opening night in Hackney watching it with them. Um, and my son, you're, you're black, you're black. Who, who cares where you come from? He has no time for that, <laughs> which I'm very proud of. We're all black. <laughs> right. yeah. oh. Oh, black. Um, so I wanted to just kind of go to the left a little bit um, and discuss the level of importance 
for Black history to be a part of England's school curriculum. Um, and I know all three of us are parents and we are parents of brown, amazing, you know, boys. Let's discuss this importance of having and working on getting the Black history a part of England school curriculum. I do understand, and Marisa, I know that you've been working really hard behind the scenes uh, with trying to get the uh, Black history a part of the curriculum, but I would appreciate if you both kind of, you know, share some insight on the importance of what you feel and why it should be a part of the curriculum. It's something I think we've both got loads to say on. <laughs> yeah. Um, Marissa, you start. Okay, so I'm going to start with a story, a real life story, which is my story with my child. So my son um, required extra help in primary school and he had a one-to-one -one. and he was, um, you know, he struggled quite a bit in primary school. We got to sort of year five and I, me and my husband were considering whether or not he needed to go to a, special, a specialist school and whether mainstream school was going to work for him. And Bailey had a great home life. At that time, I had started the PTA in school because I thought if I need to, if I want to know what's going on in my son's school, I'm going to have to be friends in my son's school. Mm. And, that's, and that's my approach and it worked very well. So I was head of the PTA before I became governor. But that's how I got into governance was I was interested in what was going on with my child, my black child in his school. Right. So... That's a very long story short. He had a very horrid time, but we worked together with school. There wasn't a them and us, there was an us that were working as a team to help Bailey have a better education experience. Bailey's last year in primary school was a game changer. His whole attitude changed. He was flying. He was calm. He was having a fabulous time. And the only thing that had changed in that year was Bailey's teacher was a black man and his one-to-one mm. -one black man. They were the only two things that, was, that had changed. The culture of the school was the same, the executive head was the same. So for me, teaching our children about their history is everything. Yeah. I think my son's, my son's experience in school changed because he was being taught by somebody that looked like him, that he could, that, that he recognized, and also that didn't limit where, what he could do. They raised the bar for him, right? So, um, so yes, yeah, so adding black history and in black history this month and the importance of it has come out for me as a governor and I've been doing um I've been running a lot of panels in particular since George Floyd's death I have been speaking to um, a number of schools to black parents to understand how their children have been feeling in lockdown and how what can school do to help them feel like they belong more and the one key thing that came out is can you please take away this black history month it's not, it's not very well celebrated in this country. It feels very tokenism. We don't want a Black History Month. We want a Black curriculum that is history, that is art, that is English, that is maths, that is science. Um, and, and please don't only teach our children Black American history and slavery, but there's so much about history that, that, that they just don't know. So yes, it's something I'm, I am working on and fighting for and will continue to. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah, representation matters. So I understand that with that experience with Bailey, and I, I already know that that was a game changer for him. Um, Aralui, how are we doing for time? Are we okay? You have, you have another uh, minute or two before the um, final segment, which is the presentation of the head wraps. Okay. So if you want to sort of get the final closing remarks from your panelists. Um, yeah, I'm sure there are a few to... questions, okay. and uh, then we'll take it from there. But thanks for checking in. Sure. Can I just quickly say, what, um, just add to what Marisa said? I mean, she talked about how, you know, we, we the, the, a lot of parents want to get rid, or people want to get rid of Black History Month. I should say that here at Black Cultural Archives, we say Black History 365 days of the year. And so for the so-called Black History Month, we actually have branded it Black Futures Month. So it's a month when we focus on young people, on young curators, anybody who's emerging in their career, and the focus is really on the future. But for the rest of the time, it's Black History every day. That's um, right, all day, every day. <laughs> and I think for the, we are, well, personally, I'm trying to focus on training for teachers, because I think the reason there may be resistance is because they don't, they don't, if you don't know the history, you don't know what you don't know. 
So if they only know it's about slavery, the immediate feeling is, oh, I don't want to talk about that. Why should we be talking about that? They don't know the rich history and that it's their history. And it's not only important for black children, it's important for white children. Because a conference I was at the other day about the Windrush scandal, one of the speakers said, would we have had this scandal, which is is the deportation of people of the Windrush generation, if the people in authority in the Home Office and government had had a a, a proper rounded education at school where they understood what the British Empire is or was and who were those communities? Then, then, then a lot of policies, I think, would be different. And then, you know, we wouldn't need a Black History Month. Absolutely, absolutely. I think because we are, thank you, Asha. I think because we are a little short on time, I just want to ask this um, question that I want uh, us to just talk about really quick. How do you view the role of Black History Month here in the UK in the context of racial reckoning that we are experiencing today? And I know this is a loaded question and it can probably, you know, carry on a little bit longer, but if we can just touch on that really quick and I will be very content with closing with that. I, I would say that it, it, began before, it, it began with the death of, with the death of George Floyd. That I think was where the sort of racial reckoning began. We were all under lockdown, but we were get, we started to, it's almost like a lot of people just suddenly woke up or a lot of organizations suddenly woke up to the fact that there is systemic racism and that it's everybody's responsibility to do something about it. So we've started to get a lot of requests from sort of established organizations, um, corporates, saying, what can we do? How can we work with you? So we're just trying to make the most of that to actually establish programs which are going to have longevity so that it's not something that's a flash in the pan and everybody eventually goes back to what they were doing before. So I haven't actually noticed a change with Black History Month, but certainly a change from when Black Lives Matter became more prominent during Mm -hmm. lockdown. Mm -hmm. Um, from, from From an education point of view as a governor, I've noticed significant change in terms of the future. So on the Hackney board, um, I know that we, for Hackney as a region, we are working on the black on a black curriculum. So schools have reached out to the borough to say um, to say we need help. We know that that we're not necessarily we don't know how to teach this the right way. Can you put something together for us by by age group by year group to ensure that we are um, teaching Black history in the right way? So that's what we're currently um, working on, and there and there has been a curriculum that has been written that has started in schools in September. There's also conscious bias training for teachers as well and for mm-hmm. senior leaders. We are also looking at one of my questions to us as a board was ensuring that our 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 schools, our senior leadership teams in particular, represent the community they serve. So if you come to school and every teacher is white and everybody and and all the senior leadership team is white, however, the black people people in your school are the dinner ladies Mm -hmm. or the cleaners. That's not, that's not the representation I'm talking about. So there is, there, is, there, is, um, there is a lot of work. There's a lot to do, but there is, I'm quite positive about the work that we're doing. Right. We are a work in progress. We have made some, some change, a lot more to come. Um, Valerie, I wanted to just ask uh, Asha if she would be so kind enough just to share a little bit about what the Black Culture Archives is doing and what they're working on um currently in london before we let her um answer q a is that okay sure um gosh we're working on so many things but we are primarily an archive of black british history so we started in 1981 so the early founders were were activists some had been involved in in the black panthers in black liberation movements in feminist movements and they gathered together all of that material and we gathered together uh, any african artifacts you can probably see one behind me i just got our archivist to bring it out quickly so that we could have an african archive museum to our heritage here we've gone more down the archive route than the um, museum route but uh, we have a, a very busy program. So we have school children that come in with their teachers to do various workshops. We have uh, university groups and outside the UK, the biggest group comes from the US, which we're very happy about. And um, we do book launches, we do um, musical events, all, all kinds of things. But what I'm working on at the moment is kind of what Marissa's working on as well, which is trying to get something established for the the, the curriculum, not just the history curriculum, but the English, the art, 
every single area and to let teachers understand it's not that they need to spend a lot of time you know inventing something new but just to show them where they can insert a more a broader understanding into the topics that they're already covering um, someone did ask what that is behind me so that's our timeline of black british history which is viewable to the public and it just shows that that the people of african descent have been here for at least 2000 years so our oldest object is a roman coin because of the emperor septimius severus who came to the uk in the year 208 and established himself here but his father was a north african the skeletons which were exhumed with him were skeletons of african men so that's our starting point to say this is where we belong we've always been here and everything else flows from that Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that, Asha. Um, before I take a question from the floor, I wanna tell you that there is this one last segment that we're trying really, really hard to get in. Uh, and that is, um, we have asked several of our uh, link members to uh, surprise us with beautiful head wraps. I'm allowed to say that, I think, head wraps today. And we're setting them all up as panelists. So we're going to ask you all, uh, if you're there, to please, uh, you can turn on your, your videos now so we can see you if you have a head wrap on and want to be seen and you're not set up yet as a panelist. Uh, quickly put your name in the chat. Um, and we're going to try to recognize uh, everyone who dressed in traditional um, clothing today or head wraps today to celebrate Black History with our London sisters, with the London community. We are really thrilled that you all were able to come in live uh, to share with us your customs. Can someone, one question is, and it's a pretty basic question, but I think important. Why was the month of October selected to celebrate Black History in, in the UK? And anybody can take that. Yeah, so I think I was, I was in conversation with both Asha and Marisa. And um, it, it, and having done my own research, it looks, it appears that um, the the gentleman just chose to do it in October. There is no um, research behind why, um, like it is in say February. We know why it is um, celebrated in February, but it looks like he's just chosen that. Now you two can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but that's my understanding that it was just a month chosen. Well, I heard that. Marisa? No, go ahead. No, I heard that it's because apparently it's been suggested that that's the month when African chiefs traditionally settle their differences. That's one possibility that's been put forward. And the other mm -hmm. suggestion is that because it's the beginning of the academic year, and so it's a time to, to start with this. But I don't know. I, 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 I no, I really don't know. I never, I personally never thought about it. It just was. But then I remember going to an event once and someone saying, why is it not October? It's so cold in October. We're sun loving people. Can't they move it to the summertime? So I don't know. It's just as it is. And we go with that. Okay, excellent. Um, so we're down to our last six minutes. I want to just uh, personally, uh, on behalf of uh, the, the links incorporated say thank you all from the bottom of our hearts from coming in today. I think we're all leaving um, extremely well educated or a lot more educated on the subject matter, uh, much better informed. And we were also very happy that um, we were able to make a monetary contribution uh, to the Black British Archives um, on behalf of your organization, Asha. So thanks again for sharing with us. When you talked about the purpose of your organization, it reminded me of uh, the Schomburg Center for Black Research and Culture here in New York City. I spend a lot of time there and it's just a fabulous uh, place that we can go to learn about our culture. So thanks so much again. And at this time, Link Shawana, um, would you like to please come in and just say a little bit about the ladies, uh, our Link sisters who have some of the head wraps on. You all, please take yourselves off your cameras if you have head wraps on, uh, because I don't want anybody to go unacknowledged. So I'm gonna let you, you do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Link Valerie. And thanks to all who have participated in this afternoon's uh, event. I think we have all learned a lot 
uh, about our history today. This has truly been a cultural experience for us all. And we do have some of our sisters on the screen donning some wonderful head wraps. We have, I see, uh, Link Josephine Rigmaiden from the Old Dominion chapter. I see we have our National Vice President, Link Ethel Isaacs Williams with her head wrap. I see we also have our National Trends Chair, Link Tanya Longino from Bucks County with her head wrap. I see Link Marsha White from Long Island Chapter with her head wrap. And to our London sisters, I see Link Siobhan Helmer. She's in the taxi, but she has her head wrap on. I see Link Dorothy. It's a little difficult to see the little squares. If there's anyone else that I have missed, and of course you Link Valerie with your beautiful head wrap on representing our arts committee. So I think I have covered everyone that I can see on the screen. So thank you, my sisters, for donning those beautiful, beautiful head wraps. Oh, and Link Hope, I see Link Hope, I see Marissa, they're still on, and Aisha with their head wraps, so thank you. Turning it back to you, Link Val. Okay, thank you so much. Link Hope, um, do you have any chapter members that you'd like to acknowledge? Um, before we wrap up for the day. Yes, thank you. I would definitely like to acknowledge our Madam President, Dorothy. She is in attendance. Um, we have Adobia, who is also in attendance. We have Link Demi, who's in attendance. And I do believe we have Link Siobhan, of course, in attendance. And I think Link Afia is uh, in attendance from Ghana. Awesome. And Link Ashley, of course, is in attendance from our London chapter. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it. All right, Link Dorothy, um, you are the esteemed president of the fabulous uh, London chapter. Thank you so much for allowing uh, your your membership and talents to join us today. Um, I'm gonna ask you if you have a final word of uh, closure for us. Uh, yes, thank you, um, Valerie. I, words cannot express how, the amount of gratitude I have for so many people attending this event from across the United States, um, our area director and the team for supporting us and making this event happen. Um, it's just the general don generous donation to the Black Cultural Archives um, and the unexpected guest appearance from our National Vice President. That really warmed my heart. Um, but also our longtime friend, our National Vice President, who we cannot wait to see again. Um, I um, travel uh, across the pond to see us when travel is a thing again. Um, and there's been so much excitement in the chat. I've seen my Scott Hawkins sisters as well. Um, but the I really want to say is from, from Sotheby's to our guest speakers, Asha, Marissa, Sister Aj, who preached a word about the wraps today. All of the contributions have been phenomenal and you've really shown the richness um, of the culture and, and brought something very different to the discussion um, to really highlight what Black culture is like across the pond um, for people um, who may not have a chance to, to engage and, and interact with us on a regular basis. But, the last thing I really want to say is none of this would have happened without my chapter members who put in work, ladies, work organizing all of this for you. Our on-screen hosts, Siobhan and Ashley and Hope, who use connections, manage logistics, source this fabric I have on my head today. <laughs> um, our off-camera support at Sotheby's, Dee Dee Mitchell, you can't see her, but she was there. All of my chapter members joining on screen, Dami, Anadobia, Renee, who you can't see, but is there. She's there with her newborn baby. I'm so, so, so proud and happy that we could give you this little bit of glimpse uh, of what life is like for us here. And, and now I would like to turn over to our Eastern Area Arts Chair to close out. Come on, come on, come on. All right, thank you so much. Ladies, I am absolutely privileged to be here with you today. This has been a ball. Uh, my phone is been really off the hook. 
much has to be growing up because people are having a wonderful time. When I conceived of art fit to the part, it was just a catchy word, right? But now we see the meaning behind it. We see the power of communication. We see the power of collaboration. We see the power of culture. I want to thank the staff at Suffolk. I want to thank the London chapter who has done an amazing, stellar job. I want to thank the Arts Committee of the Eastern Area. My co-chair, Marlon Parker Brass, and I'm having a wonderful time. We have Robin Williams, Alice Cole, Renee Beck, Carol Council, and Denise Perry. We are a powerful creative collective, and we strive to keep you uplifted. We strive to keep you mentally clear and happy during these turbulent times. So we've got a lot more coming down the line for you. We've got more museum tours. We've got more virtual book signings. We've got more. And you're going to love everything that we do, I can assure you. Finally, I'd like to say to the London chapter, bravo. I like quality. Everybody keeps saying how small you are. That does not matter. The quality that you show today is exquisite. And I salute you. Cheers. Love the accent. Okay, so on that note, this is the end of our program, and I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, stay tuned for the uh, next one. We'll announce it shortly. Again, have a great weekend. Thanks for coming in, and thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you all. Keep well. Bye. -bye. Bye. God bless. Yes. God yes. Bless you all. Thank you, my sisters. Thank you so much. Everything. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 <laughs>